There's nothing special about me. I happen to be an insurance salesman. <laughs> and this other fellow says, isn't that fascinating how modest he is? <laughs> And then I want to develop this story, step by step. They keep meeting each other because they both eat at the same automat regularly for lunch. And uh, although the, uh, the fellow really is an insurance salesman and doesn't know a thing about these things, it in the end results in the enlightenment of the person who projected this image upon him. <laughs> So there are, as I say, many kinds of guru, but the problem of the guru is to show the inquirer in some effective way that he already has what he's looking for. Now, in Hindu traditions, the realization of who you really are is called basically sadhana, and sadhana means uh, the discipline, the, uh, the way of life that it's necessary to follow in order to escape from the illusion that you are merely a in skin-encapsulated ego. And sadhana comprises uh, yoga. From the root yug, which means to join. And so from that, in Latin, we get yungari, to join, and in English, junction, and also yoke, and junction is also the word union, you see. All this derives from the Sanskrit root, yug. A yoke is also a discipline, when you yoke oxen. That is a kind of a discipline. Now, strictly speaking, in the very strictest sense, yoga means the state of union, the state in which the individual self, uh, what is called uh, the jivatman, jivatman is approximately translatable as ego. Jivatman finds that it is ultimately atman, which equals Brahman, the Supreme Self. So yoga is the state, the strictest meaning of yoga is the state of union, and a yogi means one who has realized that union. But we find that the word is not normally used in that way, in that strict sense. Yoga, in the normal way of use, means the practice of meditation whereby one comes into the state of union, and the yogi means one who is a traveler, a seeker, who is on the way to that point. But again, strictly speaking, there is no method to arrive at the place where you are. And no amount of searching will uncover the self, because all searching implies the absence of the self, the big self, the self with a capital S, so that to seek it is to thrust it away, and to practice a discipline to attain it is to postpone realizing. There is a famous Zen story told of a monk who was sitting in meditation and the master came along and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm meditating to become a Buddha. Whereupon the master picked up a brick that was lying nearby and started polishing it. And the monk said, what are you doing? He said, I'm rubbing this brick to make it a mirror. He said, by no amount of rubbing could you ever make a brick into a mirror. The master replied, by no amount of zazen could you become a Buddha. Zazen means sitting meditation. Uh, they react very badly to this story in modern day Japan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what is important, you see, quite radically here, supposing that I say to you, 
Each one of you is really the great self, you know, the Brahman. And you say, well, uh, all you've said up till now makes me fairly sympathetic to this intellectually. But I don't really feel it. What must I do to feel it really? My answer to you is this. You ask me that question because you don't want to feel it really. You're frightened of it. And therefore, what you're going to do is you're going to get a method of practice so that you can put it off. So that I can say, well, I can be a long time on the way getting this thing. And uh, then maybe I'll be worthy of it after I have suffered enough. See, because we are brought up in a social scheme whereby we have to deserve what we get. And the price that one pays for all good things is suffering. But all of that is precisely postponement because one is afraid here and now to see it. If you had the nerve, you know, real nerve, you would see it right away. Only that would be you know, when one feels you, 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 you shouldn't have nerve like that. Why, that would be awful. That would be, that, 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 that wouldn't do at all. Because after all, I'm supposed to be poor little me. And uh, I'm not really much of a muchness. And I'm playing the role of being poor little me. And therefore, in order to be something great, like a Buddha or a uh, Jivan Mukta, one liberated in this life, I ought to suffer for it. So you can suffer for it. There are all kinds of ways invented for you to do this. And you can discipline yourself, and you can gain control of your mind, and you can uh, do all sorts of extraordinary things. I mean, you can drink water in through your rectum and uh, <laughs> do the most fantastic things. But that's just like being able to run the hundred yards in nine seconds or uh, push a peanut up Mount Tamalpais with your nose <laughs> or any other kind of accomplishment you want to engage in. There's absolutely nothing to do with the realization of the self. The realization of the self fundamentally depends on coming off it. You know, the sort of, when we say to people who put on some kind of an act, we say, oh, come off it. And some people can come off it. They laugh and say they suddenly realize, you know, they were making fools of themselves, and they laugh at themselves, and they come off it. So in exactly the same way, the guru, the teacher, is trying to make you come off it. Now, if he finds he can't make you come off it, he's going to put you through all these exercises so that you, at the last time, when you've got enough discipline and enough suffering and enough frustration, you'll give it all up and realize you were there for the beginning and there was nothing to realize. But the guru is very clever. He says, all right, if this is the way you have to go, this is the way you have to go. You asked for it. <laughs> you came to me. I didn't invite you, you see, the guru says. <laughs> you came to me and I said, I want to learn yoga. Well, he said, uh, yoga is union. You, you're tattvamasi, you know, you're that. Well, now you say, I'm sorry, I don't understand that because I only get it intellectually. I don't feel it. Oh, he says, you're one of those. Uh, <laughs> so, I uh, see, uh, I've got to satisfy you. The customer is always right. No? I've got to give you all this work to do. Because you can't see directly that this is so. But he's looking at you in a funny way, you see. The, uh, the guru is always saying to you, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What's your game? Imagine, for example, a father confessor. And you feel terribly guilty that you've committed murders and robberies and adulteries and fornications and all kinds of arson and injury to people and financial shenanigans. And you go to this man and say, I am a terrible sinner. Oh, he says, really? He says, I have murdered somebody. He says, how many times? <laughs> and uh, you think, oh, good Lord, this man doesn't realize how awful I am. And you recite all these things. He's perfectly calm. And uh, then you say to him, well, uh, you don't seem to be very shocked. We said you haven't confessed any serious sins. 
He said, what do you mean by a serious sin? Well, he said, uh, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I, uh, I just feel wrong. I just feel there's something in the basis of me that feels, that tells me that I am not what I ought to be. Uh, could it be that I'm spiritually proud? That I'm egocentric? He says, no, this is not this is very usual. This is quite ordinary sin. Uh, but he says, you, you, you are guilty of something. Something really terrible. And uh, what could that be? Well, I have no idea. Now he says, come on. Come on. Go deeper. What is the real sin you've committed? And you think, what, me? I, little me, could do something worse than murder, than worse than spiritual pride? Just little me? I mean, I'm a reasonably well-intentioned person. What could that be? And he looks at you in a funny way. Does you know? You know, it's a kind of a Kafka-esque situation where you're accused of a crime that's not specified. And, uh, and yet the, jo the accuser says, you jolly well know what you've done. Of course, we can't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's like the, 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 those laws that uh, are on the books in the state of California and several other states where people are accused of the abominable crime against nature. Nobody knows what it is. I mean, it, it can't be mentioned. It's too dreadful to be talked about. So this guy does the same thing, but it's in a different dimension. You've done it. Huh? <laughs> now, what, what, what did you do? See, the, the real crime is that you won't admit you're God. <laughs> That's false modesty. <laughs> So the guru challenges, you see. He challenges you. If you raise the question, he doesn't go out and preach in the streets and say, come on, everybody, you ought to be converted. He sits down under a tree and waits. Mm -hmm. And people start coming around, and they offer him propositions. He answers back. And he challenges you in any way that he thinks is appropriate to your situation. Now, if you've got a thin shell and your mask is easily dispatched with, he simply uses a, what we might call an easy method. He says, listen, Shiva, come off it. Don't pretend you're this guy here. I know who you are. And the guy sort of twinkles a bit and says, um, well... I guess you're right. <laughs> but the people aren't like that. They have very thick shells. And so he has to invent ways of cracking them. So here is how it goes. To understand yoga, you need to get hold of a good translation of Patanjali, the Yoga Sutra. Uh, I don't know which is the best translation. There are so many of them. It says it starts out, now yoga is explained. First verse. And the commentators say now has a special meaning because it follows from something else that you're supposed to know beforehand. That you're supposed to be, in other words, a civilized human being before you start out on yoga. We don't teach yoga to baboons. And so you're supposed to have been disciplined in artha, karma, and dharma. In politics, sensuality, and dharma, justice. And then you can start yoga. Then the next verse is, yogas chitta briti niroda, which means yoga is the cessation of revolutions of the mind. In other words, uh, you can interpret that at many levels. Chitta meaning consciousness like a pool like water, like a reflecting pool. If there are waves on that, it doesn't reflect. It breaks up all the reflections. So stop the waves on the mind, and it will reflect reality clearly. Get a perfectly calm mind. That's one 
meaning of it. Or another meaning of it is stop thinking. Eliminate all contents from the mind, all thoughts, all feelings, all sensations, everything. How will you do that? Well, it goes on to say you do it by certain steps. First of all, pranayama, which means the control of the breath. Pratyahara, which means preliminary concentration. Tarana, a more intense form of concentration. Dhyana, which is the same jhana is Sanskrit for Zen, and that means profound union between subject and object, and finally samadhi, which is uh, way out. Now what's happening here? Control your mind, first of all by breathing. Breathing is a very strange thing because breathing can be viewed both as an involuntary and as a voluntary action. You can feel I breathe and yet you can feel it breathes me. And they have all sorts of fancy breathing ways in yoga. They are very amusing to practice because you can get very high on them. So they set you up these tricks. And, of course, if you are bright, you may begin to realize some things at that point. If you are not very bright, then you'll have to go on. And so next they really get to work on concentration. Concentrate the mind on one point. Now this can be an absolutely fascinating undertaking. I suggest that uh, you try it this way if you want to make experiments. Select a, a highlight on some bright, uh, some polished surface, copper or glass or something, where there's a little tiny reflection, say of a candle or an electric light bulb. Look at it and put your eyes out of focus so that the bright spot appears to be fuzzy. A fuzzy circle. Now look very carefully at the design in the fuzzy circle. And see if you can make it out. There is a definite pattern of blur. And you can have a wonderful time looking at that. <clears throat> then go back, get your eyes into focus, and look at intense light. And you can go into it, and into it, 